I'm addicted to the internet. Most people are. It's incredibly hard to resist the temptation to pick up your phone and scroll in the endless world of cyberspace, consuming YouTube video after YouTube video, tweet after tweet, where posts of prescient political news are jammed between TikTok thirst traps and memes. What happened to him? He ate without YouTube. Doom scrolling and escapism are oddly juxtaposed concepts that fit together like jagged puzzle pieces in my brain. Modern digital dystopia. Dystopia, defined as an imagined state or society in which there is great suffering or injustice, typically one that is totalitarian or post-apocalyptic. So, when I found Valhalla cyberpunk bartender action on Steam, it fit the bill of what I wanted in media. A visual novel, dystopic setting, humor and satirical critique, and... Oh, is that a girl with cat ears? And a Shiva dog? And vegan music? Okay, I'm in. Valhalla is a quiet game. It's an indie title from the four-person team at Sukiban Games. And though characters with cat ears or a literal brain in a jar will interact with you as their bartender, its story is oddly human and fraught with complexity. Some of this has to do with the historical context, as the developers at Tsukiban Games are all based in Venezuela, and if you know anything about Venezuela, several of the parallels between this postmodern cyberpunk work ring deeply resonant with the parallels of the country itself. But we'll get into that later. The game is brilliant. It's a tale that bridges fantasy with the mundane reality of working to pay your rent in a failing society. A tale of doom, and yet, boldly daring to hope something better. There's something so defiant about this game that keeps me thinking about it five years after I first played it, and keeps several of the songs in my weekly Spotify rotation. Let me explain. So what makes a game a game? Well, mechanics for one, a game is a series of choices. An action is done by the player and an outcome is presented. A visual novel simplifies these mechanics to their base levels. Often actions are presented through a finite series of choices. After making a choice, characters will immediately tell you how it affects their narrative and your story experience. The player is still an integral part, but they have less agency over the world, comparatively speaking to most perceptions of a video game. Visual novels also have a greater emphasis on the novel aspect of their namesake. Their narrative, world building, and character interactions are the tantamount draw to players. See? The board! <laughs> a collection of most of the major characters in the game. We'll use this later. Anyway, Valhalla is a visual novel, but not in the way the genre is usually conceived of. It combines the character development of bartender Jill's customers with choice-based drink mixing. The bar is a sparse environment, one window for reading scrolling text and looking at the pixelated sprites of your customers, and one window for five bar ingredients to make your drinks. When prompted, a menu appears as you look for the recipe to make a customer's request. The player drags each of the five ingredients into the main pot with extra options to ice the drink or age it, mix it, and serve. All of these ingredients have no real-world counterpart except for Karmatrine, symbolizing the amount of alcohol content in a beverage. There's also no time limit. The game meets you right where you are. When serving, a character will immediately react if their drink is right or wrong. And if you've made no mistakes by the end of the shift, you will get an extra bonus to save up for that sweet Kiramiki poster or the Shiba wallpaper. Location-wise, the game takes place between the main bar and Jill's apartment. In her apartment, you can read daily news articles from the Augmented Eye and Dystopia 4chan slash Reddit for the latest conspiracy theories in the disaster dystopia of Glitch City, and talk to Thor, her cat. <laughs> Regular riots, city falling apart, AI threatening to overtake human consciousness. Cool story, bro, but I have to go to work or I will be evicted. Such is the life of a mundane blue collar worker. The game also takes inspiration, obviously, from the era of old-school PC-98 games. The limited graphics, pixel sprites, layout of the bar menu split even, jukebox, and bangin' 80s-inspired music bespeaks a bygone era revitalized to meld the past and the future. Just listen to this awesome song.
There's another kind of aesthetic melding aside from historical inspiration in its cultural takes. The music composed by Michael Kelly, aka Gay Rod, not only takes inspiration from Japanese city pop and anime, but also American 80s music with consistency of synth and repetitive chord progressions. Something about the electric guitar and blending of synthesizers with a real-world funk adds to the diverse character of the world and sets a tonal theme for the uplifting, yet thematically terse, environment of Glitch City. Additionally, the name Valhalla is taken from the Norse mythological resting place for warriors as a symbolic gesture for weary travelers who often stumble upon the bar haphazardly. Finally, the game utilizes a highly stylized Japanese aesthetic, yet the team at Tsukiban Games resides in Venezuela. This mixing of escapist Japanese ideology paired with the tense world building speaks to Valhalla as more than just a game, but a direct real world parallel to the current state of Venezuela's government as an autocratic dictatorship. As Alma would say, give me a bad touch, President Maduro. Venezuela has a complex national history. Historically, it was under Spanish colonial rule from 1522 to 1811, when the Venezuelan War of Independence successfully evicted the Spanish. With the start of World War I, oil was discovered in Lake Maracaibo, quickly becoming the number one export of the nation. The country was experiencing such a cultural boom that it had the highest GDP in South America in 1935 due to their oil production. This led to a massive centralization of the state and enfranchisement of corporations to profit. Stocks. In 1973, Carlos Perez was elected president, resulting in another boom of oil. Prices were high, the GDP was tied directly to it. Perez funded large public programs and took on a massive amount of debt, thinking that the prices would never fall to a degree where it would be a problem. Unfortunately, he was wrong. In 1983, the Venezuelan currency rapidly devalued due to a large decrease in global prices and the national standard of living dropped significantly. Riots blew up across the nation and Hugo Chavez, an outspoken leader against Perez, attempted a coup of the government. While Chavez failed, he was pardoned and elected president in 1998. He founded the Bolivarian government on policies of left-wing populism and socialism. There was some turbulence during his rule, but overall the early 2000s remember him as a beloved ruler. Oil prices stabilized, and the GDP was solid. He funded welfare programs, credited himself as a strong ruler, and took on national debt to bankroll his projects. When he died in 2013, he appointed Nicolas Maduro to the presidency, the current leader of Venezuela. His timing was not ideal. Right after Maduro was elected, inflation went on the rise and oil prices dropped hard, leading to public riots and complaints of high rates of crime and starvation. Venezuelan exports were 86% oil at the time, so their lack of stable income led to a 2014 economic recession. Since 2014, 5.6 million people have fled the country in one of the largest forced displacements in the Western Hemisphere ever. Currently, Maduro has done away with his opposition despite riots and an incredibly poor state of living for the current citizens of Venezuela. The country is in an autocratic rule. The Democracy Index has categorized Venezuela as a 2.11 out of 10 and is ranked number 151 out of 176 countries. Life for the average citizen is poor. Most only have electricity for up to six hours a day, and frequent jailing of opposition or powerful cultural producers is exceedingly common. Maduro won't be giving up power anytime soon. Though Valhalla doesn't illustrate a one-to-one -one picture of Venezuela, there are numerous consistencies. Both Valhalla and Venezuela have a world background of an authoritarian government that disenfranchises its citizens and employs a corrupt police force to do the bidding of its dictator, Quincy, in the game. Quincy never fully makes an appearance, but his name is all over articles from the augmented eye, and is often cited by characters in the bar as a world-building flavor text. In 2016, the year of release for Valhalla, Venezuelan consumer prices rose 800% and the GDP contracted by 18.6%. In-game, the cheapest drink is $80, and cup ramen is $60, as well as being frequently sold out due to food shortages. 
About 75% of the Venezuelan population lost an average of 19 pounds in 2016 due to lack of nutrition, and 82.2% of Venezuelans are considered below the poverty line due to lack of income, inflation, and poor job economy. This parallels Jill's anxieties about life in Glitch City, as your biggest challenge in the game is to make enough money to pay rent. Yay. She even comes into work when a major life revelation strikes her with the death of someone close to her, as she can't afford to rest. There's also the imminent threat of the Valhalla bar closing due to lack of funds from their parent company at the BTC, meaning Jill's job security is tenuous and fleeting. The developers are reluctant to share their personal stories out of fear of being jailed for being a cultural producer and making money off of Valhalla. Christopher Ortiz, one of the main developers, shared in an interview with Escapist Magazine some struggles of life in Venezuela. Quote, High kidnapping rates mean you've got to lay low. You really don't want the wrong ears to know you've had a cult hit in the money that comes with it. No freedom of speech whatsoever also means you have to avoid the government knowing you exist. Game developers have already been jailed here. Unstable access to basic needs like running water, electricity, food, and internet. No way to receive money without local banks getting ripped off. High crime rate means no life. There's no way to just relax during your downtime. Every time you go out, it's a huge gamble, and I think no human deserves to live with the constant anxiety of possibly getting murdered for a loaf of bread. In 2019, Ortiz also posted a blog entitled If We Could Be Serious for a Minute. He details his harrowing reality and those of his co-workers at Sukibon Games. Three quarters of the team right now are in Venezuela, and one quarter is in greener pastures. So you've got a choice between a really dire national situation made even worse by way of constant, non-scheduled blackouts at the time of this writing, or the emotional toll of complete physical isolation from friends and family in a strange land. Their passion for the game is unparalleled, and yet their physical environment directly limits them. When your escape is through the internet and power is only tenuously guaranteed, how does one carry on? Make it through a life that actively hinders happiness. Ortiz's writing presciently carries on to Jill as a narrative entry into a world that is near impossible to persevere in. And yet, despite it all, she tries. Overall, the history of Venezuela and its current political climate only provides contextual evidence as to the developer's situation, but also provides a thematic background for the importance of Valhalla as a dystopian narrative that, shockingly, provides hope even amidst all of its gloom. What? Oh, sorry, I'm 20, I can't drink yet. So I am pouring myself some white Christmas tea. Yes, it is in fact May, <laughs> but I feel like in the spirit of Valhalla taking place in the last month of December and ending on the new year, it's a passable offense. Okay, so this is a brief little intermission. I've never made a video essay before. <laughs> if you need a little break, feel free to click off for a bit. I wanted to talk more about the cyberpunk genre and why a bunch of Venezuelan developers utilized a Japanese aesthetic. I'm not sure there is an exact reason. Sukiban Games used to run an anime blog before becoming a development studio, and as a casual watcher of anime, I can see the appeal. It's grand, escapist, larger than life, and there's an established precedent of dystopian appeal in the media. Look at Battle Royale, Ghost in the Shell, Neon Genesis Evangelion. But those aesthetics don't complete the full picture of Valhalla. Forgive the academic language. But initially on its base appeal, the game takes on a visual aesthetic of modern Orientalism, a quote, fascination and fetishization of Japan as the cyberpunk future. But it does so to a liberatory degree instead of being reductivist. All of the characters in Glitch City do conform to strange technologies as they implant nanomachines into each resident, but this is treated not as a technology to subjugate, as in The Matrix, but rather a strange facet of a unique world. There's no cultural anxiety around the myriad of aesthetically different bar patrons. Alma the Latina woman, Taylor the brain in a jar, and Dorothy the android sex worker. Trust me, we'll get there. The characters are not ostracized for their strangeness, and all of their narratives are given credence in a way that actively deconstructs the reductive Western power dynamics of cyberpunk. So why Japan? 
Personally, I see it as genre tropes. The media the team used to escape into to hide from their reality is the medium in which they want to tell a story that highlights their reality in an extreme way. They can also imbue distance from the narrative. It's not Venezuela, it's Glitch City. It's not Nicolas Maduro, it's Quincy. By adding that level of escape, they can comfortably tell their narrative from a lens that is distant without being impersonal. Whew. The rest of the video will contain spoilers for the game, especially in my Jill section. If you want to play the game for yourself, and I highly suggest you do, click off now and come back when you're done. Or skip to this... this timestamp uh, to hear my final thoughts. Enjoy and Merry Mega Christmas! Ho ho ho! So I've never personally been to a bar, but if I did go to one, I would want it to be like Valhalla. Not necessarily because of its faded 80s aesthetic or bathrooms that smell like sterile urine, but because of the people. Board time! Da 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 Yeah! A place to connect around the hardships of life, talk about yourself, and listen to others with disparate experiences. The eclectic cast of characters, including the three who run the bar, and its colorful population serve to breathe life, love, and humanity, even when the clients are AIs, into the narrative experience. As a note, I'm not going to discuss all the characters, as that would bring this behemoth of a video to an even longer time frame. I'm going to keep it to the reoccurring cast, save for one or two entries. Sorry to all the other characters. If you want a character analysis of them, please feel free to let me know. But let's start with the glue of the bar, Gil and Dana. This is going to be confusing as our protagonist is Jill and she has a male co-worker named Gil. These three, including Jill, run the bar. Jill and Gil serve drinks and are the customer facing side while Dana Zane is the quirky, chicken loving wrestler boss that Jill might secretly have a crush on. Or not so secretly when you look at her lock screen. Gil's past is shrouded in mystery. He makes allusions to Hong Kong riots in a shaded past that literally no one except for him fully knows. And that's okay. Both Gil and Dana serve not only as an introduction into the world of Valhalla, but as narrative agents to establish a witty banter of familiarity and levity compared to the dismal intro cutscene that plays when someone boots up the game. Glitch City. 207X AD, a city that shouldn't exist, a tax haven where corporations and criminal empires reign supreme. Here, brutality in all its forms is an everyday reality. And then there's Dana with a white knight police helmet stuck on her head, and hiring a Shiba Inu dog to work at the bar part-time just because she felt like it and spending an afternoon with Jill at her apartment, drinking beer, talking about life, genuinely connecting around details that serve little narrative purpose to the current events of Glitch City, but that humanize the mundane. These characters find joy in the real. In coping with authoritarian regimes or gunshots outside the bar with a smile or a diversion that even amidst present insecurities and tensions, a good joke and a friendly attitude truly does go a long way. The Lolita android appears at last. Dorothy is an interesting character to say the least. Valhalla prides itself on trope subversion and well-written characters that not only break convention but add to the complicated reality of the world. So when Dorothy Hayes, a Lilum AI with the mind of a 24-year-old and the body of a 14-year-old, walks into the bar, the last thing anyone would expect is for her to proudly claim that she's a sex worker. One with pride, depth, humanity, and self-awareness. Aesthetically, Dorothy is modeled after the Japanese trope of a lolly, a young girl who appears childlike with an often perverse romantic lean to their character. Though she takes on this initial appearance, she radically diverges from it through her sharp self-awareness. She destigmatizes sex work. She doesn't come on to any of the bar characters or is actively sexualized at any point in the narrative. 
The taboo subject of her body is discussed multiple times, and she illustrates a mature and self-designated understanding of her role within the industry. In great contrast to forms of media that broach this topic, sex is simply a human subject that the characters connect on. Sharing their experiences is no different than sharing love troubles or family strife with bar compatriots. Sex can merely be as complicated and real as it is. DeMoss stated about Dorothy's character creation that, quote, We wanted to avoid making her a victim or a bitter sex worker. Dorothy does her job voluntarily, and she likes it. She's in full control of her situation. She takes pride in her work, but it isn't her entire personality. And she doesn't shy from discussing it as if she worked any other job. She's a good friend, too. Later on, Dana even pays Dorothy when Jill is upset with a death to cuddle her for the night. Dorothy tells Jill later that she only asked Dana to pay for the cost of a soda from a vending machine as opposed to her real price, simply wanting to comfort Jill in a difficult moment. Metatextually, her complicated characterization empowers Dorothy as a sex worker, especially when considering Venezuelan context and its high levels of child trafficking. By actively forcing the player to confront their own biases and preconceived notions around sex, Valhalla deconstructs reductive conventions of media and adds depth and soul to a character who greatly deserves it. A piano woman for you, Dorothy. Alma, the definition of a girl boss. She can do it all. A cybersecurity tech agent implied to have been committing weaponized digital hacking against the authoritarian regime by the moniker Alice Rabbit, a Latina woman, and Jill's best friend. She's an interesting pushback on a couple of trope conventions, the first of which is the nerdy hacker. Alma is a genius and tells stories about hacking the way anyone would talk about their job, but she isn't socially awkward or inept in any way. She's a beautiful woman, and though the characters make one too many boob jokes, she has mental and narrative depth. Coming from a Venezuelan background, Damas wanted to create a Latina that, quote, wasn't so in your face through emphasizing her latent material culture and background of a family-centric life without reducing her to a caricature of race. Alma is, quote, beautiful, but doesn't make her dumb or an airhead. She's a hacker, but that doesn't make her traditionally nerdy. She's Latina without the dumb stereotypes. Her characterization draws upon post-racial theory in the cyberpunk world, with AI gaining self-consciousness in a political regime that infringes upon everyone's rights race is a negligible difference. Sexuality is more coded in a stigmatized lens, and even that is radically deconstructed, as we'll discuss later with Jill. Alma walks the thin line of representation. On one hand, decentralizing every instance of her race is important, as she is not who she is because of her heritage, but rather because of her skills and value system. On the other hand, one doesn't want to become so distant from the material concept of what makes a Latina a Latina that she loses all connection to her racial identity. But this isn't a problem, as Alma is a great representation not only of the cultural values of Latinx family dynamics that draws upon the developers' personal lives, but is a concept worth noting in the cyberpunk genre of reductivism for one's race. Alma often talks to Jill about her family problems, which Ortiz stated he directly used to vent about his own family. But her primary problem lies in love and marriage. Alma is a Christmas cake, a common Japanese trope to signify undesirability. In Japan, most buy a cake to celebrate the holiday. But just as no one wants to eat those cakes after December 25th, no man will want to marry a woman after she turns 25. Alma feels pressure to marry and settle down, but unlike stereotypical conventions of Latinx families, her desire to find love comes from internally, with self-imposed pressure. This provides her with agency in the narrative. She's a strong and capable woman, but is so worried with pleasing others that she has too much pressure built up to please herself, and no man will ever meet her standards. Alma also serves as a narrative foil to Jill in nearly every capacity. Alma's open about her life, Jill is reserved. Alma is openly caring and shares her feelings, Jill hides behind a snarky exterior. Alma is wealthy, Jill is poor. Alma has a rich family life, Jill is alone. These contrasts heighten each other's differences as they come from vastly different worldviews and backgrounds, but end at the same feeling, isolation. 
Alma experiences a, quote, different kind of lonely from Jill, the kind of person that's always surrounded by people, and yet those people are always family, romantic partners, not really having friends outside those circles. She's complex, to say the least. In this way, Alma transcends her designation and becomes a rich representation of varied and colorful life in Glitch City. Say and Stella, friends until the end. Valhalla likes to show characters who, despite numerous differences, love each other regardless. Let's start with Say. White Knights, Master Specialist Say P. Asagiri of the 765th Division, Valkyrie Corps. Say is a White Knight, a member of the corrupt police force that terrorizes Glitch City. She's a sweet and genuine character, honest to a fault. Despite her propensity for simple thinking, she has a true grasp of Glitch City's corruption. In describing why she became a White Knight, Say tells Jill that a White Knight attacked her friend on the street. Say herself was about to be struck down when another White Knight saved her. She then knew that she wanted to help others in the way that she was. Despite Jill's questioning of Say's motivations, claiming that they attacked her first, Say counters with, but it was another one that saved me. Her motivations are simple in following the path of justice and seeking to heal corruption from the inside out, even when she becomes actively injured later in a bank heist gone wrong. Say's innocently nuanced view of the White Knights parallels the Venezuelan police force. There are extraordinarily high levels of corruption, bribery, and poor training in all police institutions. Further, 70% of Venezuelans have a negative view of the police, paralleling Glitch City's friction and ensuing riots against the White Knights after the bank incident. And yet, though Say is a White Knight, she makes it out through the goodwill of the citizens who know her true part. They avoid her in the riots, and she makes it home almost unscathed. I don't know if Say's interpretation of healing from within a corrupted institution is the best way to help, but it's more than what others are doing. At the very least, it's a start. Stella Hoshi is a lot, character design-wise. Cat ears, huge twin drill pigtails, and, sorry to mention, a missing eye. If she isn't the epitome of an anime fantasy, I don't know what she is. If Alma is wealthy, Stella is swimming in money. Though her direct family lineage is vague, she is from one of the richest families in the city. Despite her heritage, her morals are steadfast. She gives gifts to her staff's children on Mega Christmas and makes way too much food for parties, asking the staff to take it home with them under the guise that they would be helping her rather than her pitying them. She even gives Jill a fancy bottle of liquor after visiting the bar once for like 10 minutes. Stella's kindness is given in spades, even though that doesn't exactly exempt her from all criticism. She's open to a healthy debate as to why the capitalist system of Glitch City functions as it does, but justifies it as a necessary institution that brings more good than bad. Regardless of her view, she is aware of her privilege in the city and makes no effort to hide behind her family name. In great contrast to the cyberpunk genre, she is a refreshing foil to the narrative. Often cyberpunk focuses on the class of people who are barely getting by, but Stella forces not only the player, but the characters to reimagine a world that closely parallels reality with no 100% bad actors. It's all morally gray. There's a lot more ambiguity to be found from Stella's injection into the narrative. Just like Jill and Alma, Stella and Say are narrative foils. Damas writes that, quote, Say was an attempt at giving a name and a face to the authoritarian rent-a-cops. Stella was the same idea, but for the aristocrats of the cyberpunk setting. Morally, financially, and ideologically, they are dichotomous. And yet, they're best friends. Stella met Say when they were children playing in a park. One day, an attacker gouged Stella's eye out, and a mysterious stranger saved them both. From then on, Say swore to protect Stella, and Stella swore to keep Say around. Stella becomes frazzled and jumpy whenever any character mentions the word I as a self-conscious trigger for her pain, but she doesn't hide her wound. It's a symbol of their friendship, a bond that has permanently and forcibly etched itself into her body, and she'll never forget her eye, just like she'll never forget Say. Hope out of pain, after all. Hot 
Hatsune Miku, I mean, Kira Miki is an AI superstar, Lilim, that is genuinely kind and one of the greatest vocalists in the world. And for some reason, she comes to Valhalla. On her own, she's a cameo character and doesn't affect the plot too much aside from an occasional appearance in the world building surrounding her sold out concert. But I bring her up because of Ortiz's personal experience and the impact Kira Miki has on this dystopian world. Let me tell you a story. It's not mine, it's Fernando de Mas's, but it's worth listening to regardless. Excuse my terrible pronunciation. There's this Spanish band called La Oreja de Van Gogh. On November of 2014, they finally gave a concert in Venezuela after 10 years since the last one. It was quite the feat too, especially considering that they delayed their other date for the concert until after Chavez died. I went to that concert with my family. The concert was filled with difficulties, there were delays, it was cold, it started raining while outdoors with no good covers nearby. And yet, people were just waiting, patiently. At one point, the fan club that was closer to the stage started singing. And then the concert began. If there seemed to be little to no hard feelings in the air already, any trace that might have existed vanished when the actual music kicked in. It was all loud and cheery, but not in a manner that would actually drown out the concert. At one point, the band even started singing a song after acknowledging that the fan club was singing while waiting. There were some older folks sitting near us, and when the music kicked in, they started dancing. If the wholesome atmosphere wasn't enough, hearing the band and the songs I basically grew up with live was a really, really amazing experience. Then, at the end, just as they were starting an encore, the mall cut off their power, forcing them to leave and dispelling the illusion that we were somewhere other than a crumbling country. I think a lot about this story. I think a lot about what it means for people to gather, to sing, to dream, to be as one, and to hope. Even against the odds, even when the gloom of the world surrounds each citizen for a moment, joy transcends. Music transcends. Despite it all, and yet. Hiramiki can't save the world with a catchy pop song but she can provide joy in a city that deprives its citizens of it. That's beautiful and liberating in its own way. Last but not least, Jill. I've been saving her for the very end. Jill is our protagonist. We pilot her life, but she still maintains emotional control even as she fulfills the dutiful role of a bartender listening to the stories of her customers. We see her as she is for three weeks of her life, her messy living state, her propensity towards smoking, and her general tendency to be a late 20s disaster bisexual. Jill is moody, tough, unshakable, except not really. <laughs> She's a softie who puts on a veneer of confidence to mask that her life is genuinely always on the verge of spiraling out of control. Top that off with an unrequited crush on her boss and having to listen to others live exciting lives while she serves them drinks is a tough life in Glitch City. But what gets me the most about Jill's story is her past and future. Jill and Lenore, and Gabby, Lenore's younger sister. Jill dated Lenore for three years in college. After a nasty fight between the two with Jill wanting her freedom, she left Lenore and never apologized. Moved to Glitch City to outrun time and failed. It caught up to her. The story hits close to home for a variety of reasons. How do you know when a relationship is over? How do you move on? Is there a way to say, I'm sorry, I messed up, I take it back? to flush away the past in the burning pit of guilt and shame seated in your stomach? Is there ever a good time to move on and become someone new? When you add the raw emotions of queerness, there's another dimension to Jill's pain. 
There's a reason why it's practically a meme that women loving women couples get back together with their exes so often. It's easier than straightness. To find a home with the body of another person and have them cleaved from your skin hurts. It hurts in a way that heterosexual relationships don't. I bet you've had someone you wish you could say sorry to. To patch things up. Or a smile. In a moment that things are better in the present than they were in the past. But this story isn't about that opportunity. A young girl enters the bar. She has long brown pigtails, a pink coat, and a fluffy red scarf. She stares, doesn't say anything. Eventually, we figure out this is Gabby, Jill's ex-girlfriend's sister. Gabby calls herself Jill's sister, even though Lenore and Jill have been broken up for three years, so Jill asks her, how's Lenore? She's dead. Oh. Okay. How do you say sorry to someone who died? How do you garner forgiveness from someone who can't absolve you? How do you live knowing you can't take back past pain? It's crushing. It doesn't matter that she died of localized nanomachine rejection, that dystopian equivalent of incurable cancer. It's difficult to not feel responsible. But the next day she's back at work, making money, living her monotonous routine in a city that wants to knock her down. Dana hires Dorothy to cuddle Jill the next day, and Jill talks to her patrons about her issues to an extent, flipping the script. Surprisingly, her queerness isn't stigmatized. Every NPC is happy to accept Jill's bisexuality with open arms and not a secondary follow-up. But it's a question that must be asked tenderly, with intimacy, as if one was asking about personal family matters. The lack of homophobia is refreshing. It's liberating, even, to simply have queer relationships exist with no judgment or snide remark unless the character would make a rude comment regardless of the sexuality of their target. In a way, this takes the burden off of Jill. She's able to externalize her grief, to tangibly feel it, without fear. When serving Alma, she pulls Jill out of her shell and literally moves behind the bar to switch positions. This is the first and only time we see Jill Sprite existing in the world. She tells Alma of the pressure and mediocrity of becoming stuck in a path that didn't satisfy her, the regret and grief of having burned a bridge on a whim. Alma doesn't say much. What do you say that isn't tone deaf or pity inducing? Having this moment of connection between the two is a step in the right direction. Later, Gabby returns to the bar to apologize. Jill apologizes first. They patch things, slowly. Dana slides in and invites Gabby to a New Year's Eve party at the bar. Gabby accepts. Jill's an understandable sweaty mess by the time the first rolls around. Jill finds a letter to her, mailed by Lenore. She opens it with Gabby, hands shaking. It's a simple message, one word. Sorry. Jill and Gabby connect here over grief and loss of regretting that they didn't do more, that it was too late. But mourning her in perpetual grief would be a mistake. Have you ever dropped a glass of water and had it shatter all over the floor? And you curse and cry and scream in frustration that if only you weren't such an idiot, if only you were looking where you were going, if only, if only, if only. But the glass is on the floor. And your dog is nosing her way towards the pile. And the only thing you can really do is grab a broom and clean it up before your explosion hits someone innocent. Maybe you sweep it up and you get all the big pieces but a small chunk cuts your foot later. Pull it out with some tweezers. You go over the spot again with a vacuum cleaner. Until you've put in the work to make sure that the floor is clean again. It might not be the same floor, sure, there are 
bits of microglass that might stick to your socks and make pockmarks in the wood. But the big stuff is gone. And you can walk barefoot again. Maybe you'll drop another glass in the future. Maybe it'll be a bowl or a plate or a shot glass. But worrying that you might drop something someday shouldn't prevent you from using it at all. Just be ready on hand with a broom to clean it up after. That's how I view grief. Not a promise that there will never be no fights or never any hurt. It's a promise to do better, to connect in love and let anger fade. Hope is real, tangible, physical. Hope is the people around you. Jill introduces Gabby to Alma and the ultimate melting of past and present. A new future has begun. The credits roll. A single line of text appears. Did you have fun? It's Jill talking to Gabby. She takes her to her apartment for a sleepover. And they're sisters once again. Love wins despite it all. Hi, this is apple juice. Just so you know, I thought it would be thematically on brand if I tried to make a drink. Emphasis on tried. So how do you make something that moves people? It's the most difficult thing in the world to do, yet it's everyone's ultimate aspiration. How do I become a better friend, a more persuasive speaker, a better game developer? You have to believe wholeheartedly in yourself. That's why Valhalla has gripped me for so many years. It's not special, there's a thousand visual novels out there, but it's so deeply human, even in a cyberpunk city. I believe in its message. I can't possibly imagine the physical struggle that Sukiban Games had making this title with six hour electricity spurts and constant threat of jail. But despite it all, despite their repressive government, they did. It's not a one-to-one -one parallel of Venezuela, but their words talk to their experience. Often the Western cyberpunk genre will end triumphant with the shining protagonist defeating the evil government and freeing the people a la The Matrix. But that's not this game at all. <laughs> it doesn't provide easy answers or even attempt to take down the government. Characters actively ignore rebellion and struggle just to get through their day. What is the routine for those who aren't the typical heroes of a story? How do they cope and hope for more? To that I say, love, connection, friendship, co-workers, people of different circumstance, strangers. There's an intimate familiarity in bonding despite the oppressive. After the credits roll, you're booted out into the main screen. It normally shows a portrait of Jill in a long coat, staring wistfully at the city in front of her. But there's a new element added. Gabby's there beside her, hair whipping to the side. And as they move together through the world, hope and love despite it all, life in a crumbling country, and yet we sing. At the end of Ortiz's blog post about life in Venezuela, he states this, We are all broken right now and trying to pick up the pieces of ourselves so we can keep the dream alive. We need to become stronger and keep fighting to maybe someday go back to having normal lives because making games is our passion and there's nothing that can stop us except death. And that's a big maybe. If Suki Bon Games can dare to have hope, then there's no reason why I can't too. At the start of every shift, Jill sardonically says something she learned in bartender training. Let's mix drinks and change lives. And though she's witty and sarcastic and doesn't truly believe it, I think by the end she does. I choose to believe that in Valhalla, Jill changed lives. Not only those of the characters, but me, the player. And maybe you too. So, 
raise this non-alcoholic beverage to you, Jill, and to you, the viewer. Let's mix drinks and change lives. Thank you for watching, and good night.